Hi everybody, welcome back to, this is Environment Sketching and I wanted to do a demo for you guys today. I wanted to, to, to talk about and discuss the importance of creating a wonderful looking logo for your prep book. So if you're in visual development and you're developing properties and ideas that you're going to be pitching to people, it's really important that you take the time to really examine creating a nice logo. Part of a logo is branding, okay? So you want somebody to be able to look at your typeface and be able to associate your property. And, and the thing is, is a lot of the artists that I teach and work with, uh, most of us are, I'm gonna say, we're sort of drawing and painting geeks. And basically what I mean by that is, we focus more on design, composition, and storytelling, and we sort of skip our our little, our close family of graphic design. So I wanted to talk a little bit about graphic design. And before I start here, what I thought I'd do really quick here is I just wanted to show you a couple examples. So here are a couple properties that I've been working on myself, okay? So this is what I'm gonna get into today in this demo. Um, one's based off of cookie monsters, hippos, wombats, junkyard. Now, wombats I'm not too happy with. I might go back and fix that. But what I was going for here is on my pitch books, Okay, I have this distinctive feel that I want people to see. So, you know, with Cookie Monsters, they're these sort of goofy characters, so I really wanted to incorporate part of the eyes into the O's. And then, you know, I wanted sort of a fun, playful type that was different, okay? So what I'm gonna do in a couple of minutes, I'm gonna talk about type, and then after that, I'm gonna show you some of the steps. So a lot of the artists that I know and some of the artists I teach don't really know much about type, how to import type, how to manage type, and how to create your own brand or logo that you're gonna use inside your pitch book. So that's what today's overall demo is gonna be. Okay, so if you look here, you know, I'll cover, cover some of the basics here. There's some really, really simple, easy tools to use in Photoshop to achieve something like this. Uh, this was sort of a handmade type. I actually found the, the P and the I, and then I had to change. So is that a possibility? Absolutely. You can take typefaces that already exist. You can modify them and rasterize them, and then you can use some different layer functions on them to create a nice feeling. So real quick, hippos. Um, this property I've been working on, one of the, the things, this is actually, these are ideas for some children's books that I'm doing. With hippos, one of the key things for me was having the feet of the hippos because it's about, there's sort of life in a zoo environment. And this was an early learning kids idea property that I was working on, okay? Wombats, a little bit different, a little goofy. Um, it's sort of these goofy characters. So I wanted a typeface that was a little goofy. I wanted something that had bends in it, that had curves in it, okay? Junkyard. I wanted something that felt old, that felt a little rustic. I wanted something that felt like it maybe, I like that look in some other fonts of like a, you know, a stomp typeface. This is stomped, excuse me, stamped typeface. It's been stamped and like it's, the ends are coming off. So when I went with Junkyard, you know, part of that story is about this family, you know, and their junkyard and then relationship to some visitors from another planet and so on. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get into the, the intellectual background of the properties. It's just the branding and the logos that we're focusing on. So what I like about these is this, is that I could shrink these down to about yay big and you can still get a visual read off of them, which, which is what I wanted. I could have it small on a page. So on my pitch book, if I want, I can have these in the right-hand corner of my page. If I have a separate call-out page, art direction notes on sample colors, or if I have, let's say, 3D modeling notes where I have orthographic drawings that are drawn, I could go back and I can incorporate this little logo at a small level or a big level. So rule number one, something to remember, right? What I'm creating here is not only a brand, okay, and the logo, but it's an, it's an ID that represents me and my property. So what's important about that? I want that ID to, so rule number one here, I want it to be able to translate small, and I want it to be able to, to read big, okay? Believe it or not, there are some ideas that, uh, and logos and brands that look great small, but when you enlarge them, they don't really read when they're very large. I want this to be able, if let's say for some reason I had to go to a event like Creative Talent Network or the Society of Children's Book Illustrators and Writers event in Los Angeles, and I wanted to, let's say I have a booth and I'm pitching my ideas to publishers there. Let's say Scholastic is gonna be there, who's a publisher I've worked with before and some other different, companies, right? I'm, I might decide to print a shirt that has all of these on it in color. So again, that's a benefit for me thinking about the difference between small and large, just being prepared. So, and, and usually it works the other way where you work on a design that looks really cool and then you shrink it down and it just doesn't read. If you get it down to this inch size, 
and you can't read. In fact, on that note, when I look at Cookie Monsters here, I notice that the yellow is blending a little bit too much with that, uh, with the, this sort of paper or napkin that I was going for in the back there. So on that note, something that I might do is I might adjust the background here, make it a little bit more orange or pull out. There's a little bit of an orange tint on the top of that yellow. I might adjust that, pull it out. Okay. Anyway, so let's start there. So what's the first thing that we have to do? Well, understand as artists, most of us don't understand anything about type. So let's just take, I have this wonderful presentation here. I am not a graphic design instructor by any means. So I'm going to pay respect where it's due. This is my counterpart here at the school, uh, whose name is Stephen Klippenstein. Okay. Stephen is absolutely awesome. And he created this wonderful, th he has a typography and advertising class here. And by the way, Stephen, 20 years professional experience, in Los Angeles, making movie posters. He worked on The Hobbit, Batman, you name it. He's been working for all the major uh, companies for numerous years. Total genius when it comes to design. So I was able to steal this lecture from him, okay? So what's great about it is I start looking through this, you know, I look at the feeling that you get from type. So that's sort of, you know, rule number number two. So rule number one, right, was the size relationships. Does it work big and small? Rule number two, what is the emotional feeling you're getting off the type? OK, um, there are some types that are really rough. There's some that are very loose that are. So what does that mean? You just don't open up Photoshop and decide to stick with Cooper okay, or Helvetica. There are certain fonts that communicate certain things to the viewer. And you need to think about that. Like, I really like this font right here. You know, this that's a cool font, but I don't know. To me, that's more of a futuristic sci fi font. I don't know if that would be working for a McDonald's ad that said I'm loving it, right? No, it wouldn't be, right? So that's the importance of understanding the basics of typography and what it's communicating. So here's some basics that Stephen put down. I thought these are really great, so I wanted to show that, share them with you. First, type and objectives. Understand how to use the type as a design element. Are you using this inside your pitch book? Are you putting it on a, a business card? Are you going to put it on a, maybe you have a special website you're developing because you're branding and creating properties? That's excellent. That's what you want to do. But you want to write down exactly what you're going to use this for. If you're going to create or your client, let's say you're creating a type for a client and they're going to put it on the side of a, of a, of a vehicle. Well, you better talk to them and find out what kind of vehicle that, do they have? Is it one of those new Ford, like Astro, not going to Astro van, but Ford um, industrial vans for hauling around cargo? Or is it, you know, like a little, uh, a little Toyota Prius that might have something on the side? So, you know, when people see your work, people have seen some of my work and they've asked me to do stuff on the side for them, even though it doesn't pertain to my core work I do working as a concept artist. So that's fine. There's no problems with that. There's nothing wrong. Hey, if I can make a couple hundred bucks on the side, I charge, I charge, I charge some, I charge somebody. For, that's excellent. There's still a value there. So understand how to use type as a design element. Okay. Discover the physical characteristics and applications of the type. What does it fit? The physical characteristics. What is the emotional aspect that's that's you know hitting you? And then also, what might be the limitations? Some typefaces have lined outside. Some have hollow inside. Some have different fade offs. Okay. Understand the type is a visual organizer of the information. That's right. For, what does that mean? You know, visual organizer. You're you're opening up a pitch book to somebody. As soon as they see your art, right? Their job is to. Oh, I was looking for a sample here of something that I had. I'm not sure if I have it with me. Give me a second here. Um, so their job when they first see that particular element is is. Bam! They look on it and they know exactly what it is. You see hippos, you see the feet mark, you register something with it. So something that I do is whenever I create my type, just a little heads up, I like to put something extra with it. Maybe it's just the type, maybe it's an element. Maybe I'm telling the story about, um, you know, a bunch of lava-like creatures that, you know, came from a volcano, let's say. Maybe on the typeface. So I'm, look, I'm thinking of hot lava, something on fire, I might decide to add something and a little element, a customizable element inside Photoshop to add to it. Okay, learn how to use expressive qualities of type. Um, use it to your benefit, right? Gain awareness of the different classifications of type. Uh, yeah, I talked to a student the other day and they had something in bold and I said, bold really doesn't work well. Look at other versions. Try maybe an italic condensed or condensed version or see if there's a thinner version or create one. The student came back and said, well, they don't have an italic version and they don't have a condensed version. Go make one. Spend some time and do it. What's your goal? You just don't settle at 80% and go, oh, here's my idea. I spent 
three months on creating and pitching. This is a, you know, my visual development property and a brand I'm creating. Oh, I'm just going to take the easy way out and use Cooperville. No, I don't think it's going to work that way. Okay. I think I just combined Cooper and Baskerville together. But anyway, we'll say Cooperville because that even makes it more cheesy. All right. Learning the do's and don'ts. Well, come on. Some of that goes back to design principles 101. Uh, tangencies, overlapping, um, bad reads. Okay. So on. So, uh, understanding how to use the type on the web. Uh, well, that's an important part. What does that mean? If you're going to an event and you're going to show your pitch book to somebody and you're using an iPad and there's high light conditions, that might not work. What if somebody's looking at your website that has your pitch idea or maybe you have it saved as a PDF and it's being viewed on a smartphone, let's say an Apple i6 phone. So you need to think about what are the different size relationships and how are people going to view it. So that's why when I go to a conference or event, I still don't like to bring things on an iPad for two reasons. Number one, it gets fingerprints on the iPad. I don't want to touch somebody's iPad when they've been eating a hamburger or french fries and I see their little fingerprints all over it. I want to stay far away from it, okay? Um, the second thing is, is battery life. You're showing people stuff, you're talking to people at a conference, boom, your battery dies. It's ridiculous. You know what? Take the time, go get a quality pitch book printed out that has a nice binding on it. You can pull it out, you can show it to somebody, and there's something to say about when things feel tangible. Okay, when you're holding something in your hands, right? My partner here, Frank Guthrie, he's a Maya Wiz and a ZBrush God, right? He prints out for his clients a 3D print of the toys. Why? Because his clients can hold the 3D print and they can analyze and understand it. Okay, you can't analyze and understand somebody else's iPad that you're worried about dropping or that has fingerprints with grease on them or a booger smeared in the corner. Stay away from that, okay? All right, so let's go to the next page here. It's just, I'm going to fly through some of this, uh, some of this excellence that, you know, typography. What is, oops, I backed in the chair there. What is the importance of typography? The design of letter forms and the arrangement of them, two-dimensional space for print, okay? Thinking about what it is you're trying to communicate. I know this sounds really basic. I, I just, if my class was in session right now, half of my my illustrators and concept artists would have just turned their head, but they don't realize the importance of this, okay? You're making a visual read uh, and creating a brand for people to see. So what does that mean? Why is that important to us? You're not in the room a lot of times. You've created a pitch book or a property or it's on a website. Somebody's showing it to somebody else. You're not in the room. So the person who's looking at your property, they might not be an artist. They might be somebody like my wife who is artistically challenged, okay? They might not have that background, so they are gonna respond to the use of typography and type, and they're gonna be able to look at your logo or your brand or your identification or your business card and make a connection. And if they look at it and make a connection and they don't feel a, as a positive connection, there's an issue there because you've already set up your typography to work in a negative standard. Side story really quick. I had a, we had a, a, a position here at the college and we had a guy that came in who was a professional graphic design instructor and he had this uh, palindrome typeface that he created. And it was really weird. It would read forward as it could read backwards. You could flip it upside down. It was so confusing. I ended up pushing his resume aside because I didn't want to spend the 30 minutes at time it took to go through it. And later on, when we had asked the individual, he just sort of commented like, you know, well, I really enjoy palindromes, right? Well, if you really enjoy palindromes, okay, I get it, but don't put it on your resume or business card when you're submitting for a job because right there you told me one of the most basic principles of all time, which is you cannot communicate and work directly with your visual audience, rule number one. All right, okay. Uh, letter four, okay, Typogra typographic definitions, okay. So we all know what a serif is, having that little corner, a little, you know, little corner on something, that little sway out. Um, thinking, you know, hairline, apex, these are just good things to know because if you're talking about somebody, um, it's good to use this language. I'll give an example of it. I'm in the process of getting something printed. I'm, I have a particular typeface. Actually, I got vinyl cut for my, my MFA graduation illustration show. When I got the vinyl cut, I have a really thin hairline font, okay? So one of my questions was to, to the cut, the vinyl company, after you cut this vinyl, am I gonna have a problem adhering it due to the hairline and the crossbars being super thin on the typeface? 
versus the thicker side of the typeface, like the back side, that's my own term, okay, or they call it the ascender, I always call it the back side of type, it was really thick, so that's something to think about, okay? Again, just like we work in concept or illustration, we're using a visual language with our audience here. Okay, typographic definitions. Okay, basic here, regular bold italic, hopefully we all understand that, okay? Um, it's just, I'm gonna sort of zoom through some of this really quick here. Um, X-axis, Y-axis, if you're ever in Maya, you understand what that means, okay? Um, point size, height size, um, all this good stuff that comes into play here, okay? All right, so let me just sort of go through some of this here. Spacing, okay? Kerning, that's important. You can adjust that with some typefaces. Some typefaces you can't. So when you pick up a typeface off the internet, you might have that ability to do it. If you can't, you can adjust it manually. It's a pain in the butt. How would I do that? If you're making a killer logo and you can't go in and you don't have this option right here, of kerning on the character setup for your font, okay, when it's in Photoshop, what are your other options? Well, you can create each type separately on a different layer and you can move it over and you can create your own spaces. And you could actually even create a separate layer of something that fits in the middle here of spacing and then monitor your own spacing. Sometimes that happens, you know, there's nothing you can really do about it. Okay, now look at these samples right here. Hold on one sec. Sorry. My lights went off in the room here because I'm too busy lecturing. Okay, so, um, and I couldn't see the keyboard. All right, so, you know, kerning. Look at, that's not good. Look at that space there. Here it's super close. Talking about tangencies, um, different, I, so there's a whole bunch of typefaces on the internet that you can download, stuff that you can grab. You gotta be careful and make sure it's all registering and coming together. This is something that's pretty cool. When I was downloading typefaces, again, I'm not a graphic designer or, or a typography major, or I don't have that, that history, but stuff to look at. When I was, for example, I was downloading this font called Radio the other day. Futuristic font, looks really cool. Um, they had a light, they had an oblique version, they had a medium version. Well, sometimes you have to search specifically for that. Different, different websites have different types of fonts, meaning that you might find a font that's called Spaceship. And it might be this like futuristic lettering, but they might only have face spaceship medium. They might not have oblique or bold oblique or condensed light. You have to go out and seek that somewhere else, okay? All right, because that's really important. Why? You might have the bold version right here inside part of your logo. And then when you talk about independent descriptions of items, it might be a good idea to use the future Futura condensed light. Does that make sense? Same family of type, same visual read and it works very well, okay? All right, I'm gonna sort of, let's go through this really quick here. Classifications of type, display type, text type, body type. Okay, good point. Display type, that's what I was just talking about. If I have something that's in bold, that's for a particular brand, okay? So let's go back to my little thing here, all right? These are sort of bold, they're thick letters, right? I'm not gonna use this typeface here for Cookie Monsters. I'm not gonna use that uh, to describe. I would give my viewer a headache. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen student business cards and websites where they fall in love with some futuristic, alien, weird typeface that they found somewhere, and then they use it to describe all their work and everything. Eh, go for the prize behind door number two. It's not a good idea. In fact, it's a dumb idea, okay? So there is display type, and you have text type or body type that's gonna be really important, okay? Uh, just another note, script. Be very careful with script. If something is too scriptive and it's too loose, you shrink it down and it gets too thin, doesn't read well. Again, think about your type and the applications on how you're gonna use it. Okay, let's move ahead here. Serif, we all know what serifs are, benefits of that. Sans serifs, okay. Let me sort of move forward here. Script, uh, this is a good point. Scripts were originally created design echo handwriting. Uh, look at that. I can't even read that thing in there. It gives me a headache. All right. Communication with the audience. Important things to think about, right? Communication with the audience. Legibility. The right font for the right job. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, when you go into a font and whatever you pull up off of an internet site, always go back and look. Check other sites. See if they have different versions of it. It could make a huge difference in your design process. Okay, styles, modern, classic, urgent, formal. Okay, funny. Every one of those typefaces there communicates some type of emotion. If you're not good with type and you're a concept artist who loves to draw, then take a break, 
pick some typefaces and show people. I'm not a type guy. So what I do, I mean, sometimes I see it, but then I send it to friends. I send it to fellow artists and colleagues that are designers. I even ask my students sometimes, what do you think about this? Is this a quick visual read? Is it not? Let me go from there. Okay. All right. Uh, vector base, raster base. Just to talk about this really quick, we'll get to that in Photoshop in a minute. What does this mean? Well, when I have a typeface, if I want to alter it and be able to paint on it and modify it, I have to rasterize it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Vectorize type. You have certain type that you can create, especially if you're going to illustrators, uh, excuse me, Illustrator and other documents. You can create outlines with that type, and that outline is usually using what they call an EPS curve tool. So what does that mean? That means I could take something that I've created outlines on. So let me walk you through that process. I can create a typeface inside Photoshop. I can bring that into Illustrator. I can select the typeface and I have to load the font into Illustrator. I can go to uh, under object, create outlines. I can now take those outlines and they're vector based. So no matter how big or small I enlarge them, they keep their resolution. Aha, really important. Well, what else could you do? Photoshop has on that principle something very similar. You could even rasterize type inside Photoshop. You can select it. You could define it as a custom shape. And then once it's defined as a custom shape, it's the same principle. You can enlarge it to any different size and it's going to maintain its resolution. Fantastic way to work. Okay. Well, I mentioned I was getting vinyl cut to print on a wall. When I get vinyl cut, I have to create the outlines and bring that to the company because that's what the, the CNC cutter machine uses that cuts around the outlines. There's a reason for that. Okay. All right. So enough of that. Let's uh, thank you, Stephen, for the wonderful notes. Let's move ahead here. So let's talk about basic type. Where do we start? Well, so if I open up Photoshop here and I have a basic document, right, let's go in here and I'm going to create a new layer here. Once I touch down with my font here, then let's, let's, I don't know what we're going to do today. We mentioned spacecraft earlier. Um, space. Uh, let's do, yeah, let's just do it like this. I'm just goofing around. I want to see what I'm going to get. So let me take this right now. A couple things. Look, I created that in Photoshop. You guys know this. You have your font layer there. Some people do this really quick. They hit transform, they enlarge it. You can do that. That's, that's a total option. There's nothing wrong with that. However, though, if you ever go back in later and you adjust this, Okay, you, you have to realize that you've sort of made a little change in there. What I mean by that is as you've scaled it up, look at the height, it's 94.23, it's not an exact measurement. If your client says you have to have something at 80 or 94 and you can't have little increments, that's something important to know. So if I come up here under the quick option of fonts, you know, I can say, well, maybe I want it 72. So there's my font. Okay, first thing I want to go over with you before we start importing fonts and bringing some other things. Number one, be, always make sure you have a good antivirus system. Okay, um, let me make sure we're still recording. Yes, we are. Antivirus is extremely important. Why? Because there's a lot of tools and a lot of jerks out there and on Macs aren't as susceptible to some viruses. So if you if we go sh shopping for type, right? So I'm going to pull up uh, the site here. I'm going to go to Google. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to type in futuristic font, F-U-T-R-I-S-T-I-C. I hope suck at typing. Okay, so I click this open and look, all these sites come up. Free fonts here, fonts here, fonts there. Most of the time I don't have a problem downloading it. This is a great, actually I love this site right here. It's 100 fonts. I was going through this the other day, found some really killer fonts that were very similar. So if I'm looking for something futuristic, let's say I want this one right here. So all I have to do is I have to come over here. I'm going to hit download. Now, every company has a different policy. Okay, so now how do I install that font? Well, it's really easy. Back in the old days, it was a pain in the butt. If you have a PC, it might be the same way. You have to look up depending on your operating system preferences. Um, you can Google that. Usually you have to go to documents, users, library, find Photoshop and put it inside that folder. And that's how you install the font. With my Mac here, I can click, I can go to Good Times. I can click it open, and what it does is it gives me, gives me this basic read here. Now, it is important sometimes to click open this document. There's a PDF attached with all the fonts. Um, whoever created this font, this is basically a legal binding contract. 
Please note before reading and installing the fonts, if you don't accept this agreement, don't install the font. That's a good point. Why? If you create a font and it's for free, for public use, as long as it doesn't involve money, that's important and that's important to me. So if I'm doing something that's for an art show and I'm just sharing my work with a community or putting something online, I could use the font, okay? You have to read these descriptions. Every font has different descriptions. So if somebody says on there you can't use it to make money and you turn around and make t-shirts that you're selling it at an event with your brand or logo on it for 20 bucks and that guy happens to be there it's a small world right um, he has a right to sue you now you've broken a legal obligation so it's important you go through this if you're doing something for class or a basic pitch book I totally get it you're probably fine right but if I sell my property to DreamWorks let's say I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna find this guy and I'm gonna tell him hey I used your font to make money off of it what do I owe you how much do you want for this font he might say well I want 50 bucks I'm not gonna tell him how much money I made that's none of his business but what I am gonna do is make sure I'm within the parameters of that agreement okay anyway to install the font this is all you do if you have Photoshop open and I come over here and I double click the font like this it brings up this little window right here it's called font book font book asks me if I want to install this and look, sometimes it even has different options there. I hit install font. Okay, boom, it brings us up right here. Okay, and it should be installed. Okay, that's it. It jumps right in. Look, I even installed, there was radio right there. Okay, and radio, look, it came with, I found a bold version of what I was talking about earlier. So there's good times right now. So what, I, what do I have to do if I click off of this? I'm going to come over, I'm going to move this back. I'm going to click up here. Okay, I'm going to go to my type options. So... Real quick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. I'm going to move my spacecraft. I'm going to move that down to here. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to highlight this really fast. Select it. I'm going to come back up here. And remember, it was called Good Times. So I'm going to scroll down here. Let's look up here. And hopefully, I have it. There it is. Sometimes I've noticed I don't. I There are a couple typefaces that I've had. If, for example, the other day, I was looking at the alien typeface. Um, it's called per Perillion. P-E-R-U-L-I-A-N, I believe, and I couldn't get it to install right. Uh-oh, I didn't mean to do that. And I had a huge issue getting that to work. No big deal. I dumped it. Something wasn't right about it. So look at that. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? Look at the huge change, okay? This type right here, when I touch up here, okay? So I touch that layer. Let's turn it off and on really quick to see where we're at there. Oops. I prefer this habit I have of right-clicking on it. So I look at this type right here. And I'm going to come down. That's Myriad Pro. Myriad Pro really isn't a good idea for spacecraft, is it? Okay, so uh, what are your options? They're unlimited. So before you start clicking and creating a bunch of typefaces, this is what you need to do right here. See this little guy? Okay, you want to come over. So I saved us the time. I went to a bunch of different websites the other day. And sometimes I'll be bored sitting at home. Like, I, let's say I've been painting for six hours. I can't do any more concept art. I'm, my brain's going to have a hemorrhage from doing my work. I have 40 minutes of a break or something. You know what I do? I go hunt for a couple typefaces. I might type in futuristic. I might type in, um, you know, uh, silly. Or I might type in wonky. And I find something really cool. So after you download this stuff, here's the number one problem I've noticed when working with artists. No one organizes anything. You have to organize. So what I do is I create a little folder. I just don't click all my type open like this from here and download it. Because why? If I go back to my, my box here, where's my box? Sorry. If I go back to uh, my browser, okay, and if I look right here, here's my download button, right? There are my downloads. What if somebody else clears? What if somebody else comes in here and says, up, oh, clear? All my downloads are gone now. And I might not remember what site it was from. And here's the funny thing I was talking about to a couple students the other day. I was at home and I typed in futuristic fonts. And because of either the version of the browser I had or previous uh, cookies and web data, it brought me up some different websites. And then I came here to the school I teach at. I typed in the same thing. And I, got, I found totally different sites that I had never found before. So there's something to say about your search engines, depending on where you're, hinked, where you're hooked up to, uh, your, your, your code for your, your Ethernet outreach. So I might get more hits or find better websites being at school at the college I teach at. Why? Because it's a college and we probably have... 50 to 100,000 hits coming out of our, our service number every single day out of the school, which is crazy, right? So I get the benefit of finding these better types here. 
Okay, and let me pause real quick here. I'm gonna stop the video and then keep going. Okay, welcome sure back. We so what I'd like to do now is I like to look at multiple options here. So obviously, uh, Myriad Pro is not gonna be an option for me, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate this layer. And I know there's a couple of hotkeys to do it with. I'm actually gonna just move this typeface down. And I'm gonna do it maybe a couple more here. This is a demo, so I have to keep it a little bit low on time. Okay, so now with that down, I'm gonna come over here. So what I was saying before is move all your typeface, type your fonts into a folder. Look, I created a folder here, new fonts, and I open that. Look at this, that's one day, folks. A lot of killer fonts right there. Um, and I open these, I forget what some look like. I can come back and look. So I'm gonna open a couple of these. Since it's a demo, I'm not gonna read all the instructions. I'm gonna open up, beware there, I'm gonna tell it to install, okay? And there, that's up there now. So I'm going to come back here. Let me make sure. Sometimes you have to click again and get it to go in there. That one in. So that one's beware. And I think I'll do one more. Let's try this escapade here. Okay, let's click that guy there. Okay, install font. Okay, aha, this happens sometimes. And this is a problem I've had sometimes where they don't install. You have to then click under font validation, what you're installing. And then you have to hit install. And sometimes they get this, if you see this, it's a little window right here that tells me there's a minor problem found. Proceed with caution. That's a good point. That might be, could be a virus or something. I don't know what it is. That's why the antivirus is so important. If you're using a PC, you better have something good on there because people put viruses all the time in things that are downloadable. Fonts, filters, stuff like that for Photoshop, brushes. They put viruses in because there's a bunch of jerk-offs out there. Okay, install that, right? So, I have Escalade and I have Beware. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna close this right now and let's come back down here. I'm gonna select this option right here. Let's highlight it. Let's go see what we have inside Photoshop. By the way, this works the same way for Illustrator. I get that all the time. Well, how do I install the font in Illustrator? Well, it's really simple. Open up Illustrator and then go click the font and it'll automatically sense itself in on a Mac, that is. Now on a PC, depending on what version of operating system you have, that might be a little different. You might have to go to Documents, User Preferences, or Applications, and enter it through there into the Photoshop file. Okay, let's come back up here. Um, I'm gonna scroll down here. I'm looking for Beware, right? And then, come on, let's go up here. And where is it? My alphabet memory is not working. Where? Well, okay, where is it here? Did it not go in? Um, there it is, there it is, I got it, boom. So that's Beware. Okay, there's another totally different font. Pretty cool, right? All right, now let's come here, let's try the other one. I think it was Escapade, right? Let's click here, let's go up here. There's Ease, where are we? Oh, and look, Escapade made it, awesome. So what's happened to me before in this process? I have actually lost, I've had some type that doesn't come in right. The first thing I do is I get rid of it, okay? All right, so obviously I don't need this one anymore here. I'm gonna take this guy off right here. Let me right click on this font here. All right, and take that off, all right? Sometimes I like to label them, just me being picky as one, two, three, because they're in order going down and I'm trying to find out what's gonna be the best font. Okay, so what we're gonna do next here is we're gonna talk about a couple options on what we can do and how can we, we can manipulate our type. So. This is what I highly recommend that you do when you're making a logo and you're making adjustments to type. You don't want to lose what I call your master page. So if I'm doing, let's say this is my spacecraft logo, right? I don't want to lose this page. So it's a good idea to, for me to save it this way. I'm going to hit save as. And what I'm going to do is come over here on my desktop. I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call spacecraft, oops, okay, logo like that. Okay, I'm going to create that right now. And then when I open up that folder, what I'm gonna do, I like to I like to work in phases. It's a great secure way to make sure, I do this with my concept art or illustration or anything else. It's a great way to make sure I don't screw something up or over save on top of a master file. So I prefer to think of having master files, work files and files for print. Okay, that's an easy approach. So now that I have this done, um, I click that open. I'm gonna create another new folder inside there. I'm gonna call this master type. Okay, you can call it master font, whatever. Now I can open up that, and then I get, and now under here, I'm gonna go versions. That's it, versions.psd, I'm gonna hit save, boom. Now I've created that in there, okay? Now that I have that done, we're gonna, a minute here, we're gonna start talking about some options. So, what can I do? How do I manipulate this type? Well, there's so many different ways to manipulate it. I can select the color, change it, whatever. However, though, when you do manipula manipulate it, you don't want to get rid of the master font. What do I mean by that, okay? Um, see this right now? So let's take this for example. Let's say I wanna go in here 
and I want to start modifying this font right here. Oops. I want to move stuff around. Let's say I want to make the S a little bit larger. Well, guess what? I can't right now. It's a font. What I have to do is if I right click on this and go to rasterize, it rasterizes the type and it allows me to make those changes. However, you have to remember I can't go back to it. So what I like to do, remember I told you the labeling thing? I do this as typeface 1, typeface 2, typeface 3, right? That way I, this is where this helps me is I know the grouping. Now what I do is I can come over here and check this out. I can duplicate this font right here. So let me do that. See, it's three copy, but what I can do is sometimes I come over here, I'm going to put an R next to that, for meaning that's typeface number three that's going to be rasterized. So let me do that again on these other fonts here. Okay. I learned this from a background painter that I worked with in the industry. He's really good with his files, and he talked about when I go back to recover something, I don't ever want to lose anything that I made a mistake on or saved over. And it, most artists I know don't get this they're not this meticulous and organized, but I really think that you have to be. It's just precautionary and you save yourself time. Now what I can do is I come back and I turn off all the masters. Do you see that? Now I click on this and I'm going to say rasterize. Boom. Okay. So now look, I have a rasterized typeface. So I'm going to click on all the R's and I'm going to rasterize them. Rasterize there. Click on this one, rasterize there. Okay. So why did I do that? Why? Because if I come over to this, if I come to space right now and I'm making my logo, and I decide like, hey, I really like this right here, but I might want this to be a little bit taller like that. Well, I have two options. I can do a quick adjust right now, or I can go in there and I can create a separate type with the S separate and modify it that way. It's up to you. I like doing this because what's cool about this is there's different options that I can apply. Let me get in a couple of those options in just a minute here, and we'll talk about two different things. We'll talk about... Uh, uh, well, I actually have three different things to talk about. We're going to talk about how we can fill the type, paint on top of the type to create something different. Um, we're going to use a couple of different effects. So we're going to use the effects layer in a minute here. Um, we're going to come over and we're going to talk about a layer mask and we're going to talk about a clipping mask and some of the different, uh, different options. So I'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Hi, this is uh, Phil Dimitratis back again. Sorry, I had to take a break there between classes to finish this demo up. Okay, so let's get back to what we we're talking about here. Um, give me a minute here. I created another typeface. And what I wanted to do is I was starting to talk a little bit about uh, organization. So a lot of the artists I don't know organize anything. Okay, so what I was briefly talking about is this is what you want to do. This is huge, okay? Because don't be the student who's in a hurry, who's rushing, downloads type, and then you have to come back here to this icon here to see what you downloaded. And you can see what's happened is somebody else uses this computer and they cleared all the type fonts, so they're gone. So luckily, I grabbed everything that was downloaded, and look at what I did. I dropped it in this folder here, and I call it New Fonts. Inside that folder, I then labeled, um, I mean, it automatically labels everything, but I have everything there structured for me, and there's a huge benefit for that because as I'm working, um, it also affects the way that I save my Photoshop file. So I want to quickly go over that with you. So this is what you want to do. Set up a base folder, okay? And in this folder, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this Spacecraft. Okay, if you do this, I actually learned this when I was working in Maya in the entertainment industry a lot because I have to save in multiple versions. I would have different types of files, files that add textures, image planes, uh, backdrop paintings, map paintings, all that stuff. And that really affected my workflow the way I worked with Photoshop. Okay, so check this out. You open up this, if I open up this file and I come over here and I pull my Photoshop file, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this Photoshop file right now, save as, okay, and if I go to desktop right here, I'm going to hit, um, let's go to recent here, date modified, there's spacecraft that I just created. So I'm going to call this, instead of versions, actually, why don't I call this space craft dash versions. I always put the word master in there, master, so I know what it is, okay? All right. Now that I've done that, anytime I open up this folder, spacecraft here, boom, I have my master. Well, what I like to do then is I create three different folders. I'm going to create master, and I drop that in there. Okay, that's my master file that I never want to save over, okay? I'm going to create another one here, and I call this my working. What does working mean? Working is a file that's going to have, that's when I go in there and I start to rasterize things and put effects on things and mess around with it because I'm changing the overall look of it. The next folder I put is I have created a JPEG folder, okay? My JPEG folder is, and what I do is I open this and I have two forms of a JPEG. One is a lot of times if I send something to print or I go to print, for example, if I go to like Kinko's or FedEx and I go to print a document, 
I'm not going to bring a full size layer document to print for a client. I'm going to bring a flattened JPEG and then I even adjust the size. And then the next folder I want to have is I want to have email. Okay, so what I mean by that? Well, I'm working with a client, I'm sending off logos, I'm sending off um, reference pages, concept art, whatever it is. I want my client, I want to be able to save the printed file, which might be, so bear with me. This is a flattened two or 300 DPI JPEG, okay? I then adjust that and save that for email. It's 72 DPI, so it's a it's an email size that will not get bounced back by a server, depending who I'm selling sending it to. So if I'm doing work for Disney or Warner Brothers and I'm sending my work in, um, I need to be able to quickly open it. If you don't do this type of organization, you are creating a world of hurt and pain and suffering for yourself. Okay, Argit artists are naturally disorganized people. And it's very true. And, and until I got into the world of Maya when I was working professionally modeling environments and sets, um, there's a huge difference in changeover working with people and entertainment on a pipeline that had to be very structured. So it's in your best interest now to think about what you're doing. Look, I want to go find what I'm looking for. I have my master file. I'm going to grab my new fonts. I'm going to throw it in here so I know where my new fonts are. I can put that down below. And one of the things, you know, this is pretty cool too, is I can put a little highlight tag. Boom, that's my master file. That's key for me. Okay. Back to this now. Now let's start talking about how we can modify some of our type here. So it's really important, whatever you do, I think I mentioned this before, is that when you have type that we're gonna we're gonna play with or, or modify, make a copy of it. Okay. So what I do is if I have this type right here, do you see it's number three right there? Okay. Um, if I turn that off, I have a rasterized version of it. Do you see that above? How do I rasterize type? Well, if I didn't cover it, it's really simple. All I have to do is I come in here, I right click on the type and I go down to rasterize type. Okay, there's a huge difference there. Once I rasterize type, it's rasterized, it's done. What does that mean? Well, I mentioned before about creating outlines. If I wanted to get this printed on vinyl or cut into wood by a CNC cutter by some type of outside printer, I need to save it as an outline. So it's a good idea to duplicate your master here and keep that as a general backup. Okay, so I would highly recommend that. Okay. Um, so with that said and done, what I'm going to do now is I want to show you a couple ways that you can modify and let's go in and start having some fun. So first thing, I think one of the a really important thing a lot of artists forget is how to use a clipping mask. So let's talk about a general clipping mask. Okay, so what we're going to do here is, sorry about that, someone knocked on the door for a minute. So look, I have, let's go over some basics here. How can I mess with this type? Well, there's three basic things that we can do. One is I want to go over a clipping mask really, really quickly. And you know what? I'm not a graphic design guy. Um, I love graphic design, but that, I'm a concept guy. I like to draw and paint. That's my background. And I've spent, you know, over 16 years in the industry working in animation, concept, art, and other related type of work. So let's take a look at this, okay? Um, so bear with me. Some of you might know a faster way in Photoshop how to do this. Amen to you. Photoshop's changed. I learned Photoshop in 1996 and then I was using it professionally when I started working in the industry in 97. Well, guess what? It's totally changed and you might know a faster way to do this. If you do, amen to you. If not, just sit and listen and try to get something new. So check this out. I have a texture right in here. So look, I have this typeface right here. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. Where'd my texture go? Okay, so what, see that texture? That's pretty cool. It's like a, I just looked on the internet and I found this space texture right here. Okay, I also had another texture that I thought would be really cool. Let me find it. I have the, that's a piece of wood that's stretched. You never know what you're going to get or what it might look like. And then if I come up here, what's, give me a second here. I have this texture right here. I was going to put that on top of that spacecraft. So I'm going to go over how to do that really quickly with you. Give me a second. I'm trying to find my... Where's my metal? So it looks like I lost my metal texture. So let me bring that in really quick. Bear with me for a second here. Uh, what I'm going to do is take this right here. So select all, copy this, and I'm going to come over here. And right on top of this spacecraft font right here, I'm going to put that texture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to transform it. So this is a basics of a clipping mask, OK? If I put that down right now, I need to move that directly over my layer. So double check. Can you see? Um, that's the lower type. Let's turn that one off. I'm going to right click on that. That's type two. So I, there we go. I'm going to put that right here above type two. So all I have to do right now, and this is pretty cool. This is a benefit of a clipping mask. I just come over here and I right click on this and then come right down here and I go clipping mask and bam, look at what happens. That texture is now placed over my type. 
Well, that's really cool, right? That's something that I could do. I could use that now as a logo for a show I'm pitching. And here's the great thing about a clipping mask, right? Check it out. I'm moving the texture behind it. Do you see that? That's really fantastic. It's really easy to do. Okay, so, um, and again, if I don't like that, look, all I have to do is I could come in here and I can say release clipping mask and bam, I'm back to normal. Okay, um, that's a huge incentive for me. So I could just come over here. I could take other layers. Watch, I can duplicate this layer, hit OK. I'm going to bring this layer then down back here on top of number two. Turn off that, turn this layer on. I'm going to bring it down here and uh, let's do the same thing. Right clip on it, clipping mask. Boom. Now I have, you know, that planet back there. Now, again, depending on the font and the size and what it looks like, you know, it's going to affect the way they can modify it. But what's cool is see, check this out. Aha, I can even transform and I can adjust. Look, I can put the base of a planet through spacecraft if I wanted to. That's one option for me, okay? And then I could modify that. So we'll get back to modifying that in just a second, okay? I want to show you the next option that you have here. So here's the next option, right? And uh, this is, always gets a little confusing to me. Let me release this. Okay, so here's the next option. You have to sort of follow these steps. Let me see if I goof this up or not. One second. Okay, so this is what we're going to do now. This is how we, we use a layer mask doing the same process. It's a little bit more complicated, and a lot of people don't tend to do this, but check this out. I have this up on top, right? So what you're going to do is when this is done, I'm going to hit Command. I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to touch the type layer underneath the T. As I touch that T, do you see what happened? I just now came in there, and I basically selected that type. What I'm going to do now is come down here. I'm going to hold my cursor down in the left-hand corner. I'm going to add a new layer mask, okay? Boom. Now what's happened, this is what's really cool about this, is that I have I basically did what a clipping mask is. Okay, I've, I've placed the information back there. However, though, there's a lock on it, and here's the benefits and the cons of this. So the, what are the benefits? The benefits are if I want to move this, I still can, just like the clipping mask. However, I need to come over, turn off the lock right here. I need to touch the image right here, and then it gets highlighted. And now look, see when I move it around, I can adjust that font in there easily. Do you see that? Pretty cool. All right, now, excuse me, not the font. I can adjust the image inside the font. Now, that's one option. Now, when I'm done, I got to turn back on that lock, but then I also have this option, okay? I also have the advantage to use the layer mask in the layer mask form, okay? So check this out. I click this right here, and now if you look over here on my black and white, okay, it's going to basically allow me to do the additive and subtractive process of any brush I select affecting the font, and this is what I mean now. So now I take a brush, you see what I just did there? Bam! Well, okay, that might not look that cool. Re please re remember, I'm using a mouse right now because I'm at a teacher station, but look, if I come across here and I can do this type of effect, so hold on a minute, I realized something there. Let me come back, let me turn off the lock, I need to move space all the way over the, the text like that. So let's say I have it about right here, okay? That looks cool going over the T a little bit, right? Then I come back, I turn on the lock, now I click on the mask itself, and then I come back here with my brush settings, and watch, if I put my brush, remember your brush settings and your layer mask work with the full effect of the brush. So I'm gonna put this brush at 10% right now and sort of come across here. Do you see what that ha what's happening? It's picking up the whole image. So I could come down here, and I could do some type of like funky blend techniques. You see that? I can get a little bit of space to sort of show in there if I wanted to. Okay, I could even go over the whole thing and get that sort of image to pop up behind there if I want. You see that? Okay, um, that could be a really cool thing because there's different things that I can do with that. So that was just one particular brush right there. Let me Command Z and go back. What if I take a rough texture brush that I have like this right here? What if I come in here and, and just sort of click it along and see what happens? I'm basically, now watch if I go to zero, bam, I can bring back the whole image really quick, right? And then if I want to subtract it, I just switch colors. If I hit X right now and I switch to black, what I've done is I basically, I'm now using the opposite value of the brush. And it's the same thing, same principle of like the dodge and burn tool. But now I'm coming in here and I could actually modify and create different effects and images on my typeface here. That's a huge incentive me, for me to know that. However, though, remember the process of what I did. Okay, so let me go Command-Z. Let me back up there quite a bit. This is the easiest part, and to be honest with you, I forget it all the time. Anytime I have anything that involves like four or five steps in there to get to a process, it's really easy for me to forget that. Okay, so let's go back through that process. Let me Command-Z a couple more times. So look, here's my image, right? 
actually, let's go back here. What I had to do, remember, is I have the image, the, te the, the texture. I'm just sitting right up on above it like this, okay? So now that I have that up on top, what I do is I click on this, I hit Command, okay, and then I come down and I touch, and what that does is it gives me the indication of where the font is. Once that's done, I have to come back and I have to apply the layer mask. Once the layer mask is on, what happens if I go right now and if I try to move that? Look, it moved the whole type. Well, that might be in a benefit. Why is it doing that? Well, because it's a layer mask itself, right? Remember that. So it's moving everything. I have to take that lock off right here, okay, and then select the image right there if I want to move the image behind there. That can be a real benefit for me. However, though, if you don't do that, look at what happens. What happens if I do come in here and I move that? See that? I could create a really cool logo right there. I have something that I could work from. Okay, and what's cool about using this is I haven't modified my type layer in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so if I come over here, I can just, that's a great thing about using layer masks at times, um, is that if I delete that, I'm back to my original top, my type and my font. Okay, and nothing's really changed. Okay, so let's say for some reason, uh, let's use that metal one on here. So I'm going to just do a clipping mask now. Now let's talk about modifying this a little bit. Okay, so this is the right way approach to modify something if you're going to create a really good logo and we're going to get into some FX principles which are down here that there's the FX options. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is going to do a clipping mask. I have this over spacecraft. I'm going to right click on it um, and I'm basically going to come down here and say create clipping mask. There, I have something that I really like right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do, now I need to think smart about this. I'm going to label this. I'm going to call this steel clip mask so I know what it is. Now if I flatten this right now into this, what happens? Well, it becomes a layer. It basically becomes rasterized itself. However, what if I had to go back and adjust the font? What if my client wanted the S to be bigger? Well, then I'm in trouble. So what I like to do is I like to leave things labeled. I had this called layer two. I'm going to call this uh, steel clip mask for layer two. Boom. Now it's labeled. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to duplicate both of these. There, they're duplicated, and then I turn off my originals. Now I have this to work from, okay? So I'm gonna, let's try two different options here. I'm gonna keep this one right here, okay? And I'm just curious, what if I take the clip mask? See, now I can't move the clip mask, I'm moving the structure behind it. So let's see what are some options that I could do here. Watch, I'm gonna duplicate this again, okay? And this one I'm gonna bring down, oops, sorry. My bad there. I duplicated the wrong one. Let me duplicate both layer selections there. Duplicate. Okay. I'm going to compress these now into one layer. I'm going to bring this down here because we're going to talk about modifying this. Then I'm going to come back up here to my original clip mask and we're going to talk about modifying this a little bit. Okay. So let's start back up here. Okay. Here's, this is the main typeface right now. What happens if I duplicate this? Okay. And I bring this underneath. Well, you can see it gets modified there a little bit. So Give me a second here. Remember I have this other copy right here. I'm going to put a drop shadow under space and get that spacecraft to, to pop out there. How can I do that? Well, I duplicated the layers. I'm working smart, right? So here, now you duplicate this. I'm going to put it underneath here right now and I'm going to come over and I'm going to move it back just a little bit here. Oops, got to turn it on. That would help. So what I can do is you see this? If I move this underneath, look at that. I now have spacecraft with a steel sort of effect in there, right? And that steel effect is here. It's my clip mask, right? You see that? I can turn it off and on. Then on top of it, I have the type that it's on, and then I created a shadow by duplicating the original text underneath, and then I have that as one option. So that's one option the way that you can work if you don't want to flatten it. I side on not flattening everything so I can go back and make some other adjustments. Here's the other way that I can do it. Let me turn all that off, okay? So remember, this version I have down here, this is the version that I flattened, right? Well, what's really cool about this is since I flatten it and it's now a rasterized layer, what I can do is I can use the FX down here. And this FX is quite wonderful. Let me show you. So what I'm going to do is as I have this selected right here, and actually I'm going to label this. This was my, my font 2 or my version 2 basically, and I'm going to call it flat so I know exactly what it is. It's basically rasterized. So now with that, I'm going to come over and click FX right here. And I'm just going to pick one of these. And what it's going to do is it's going to give me the options, okay? So I'm going to go for I'm going to go for that shadow effect right now. So I'm going to call that a drop shadow. And what it does is this is the part that's really cool is it see it brings up the the layer style selection for all of the FX menu. And by doing this, I can go into drop shadow right now. Do you see that? So I have a little bit of a drop shadow happening, but now I need to manipulate it a little bit. So check this out. 
if I hit the angle control right here, you know, I can adjust a little bit of the angle and where it's coming from. Look, I can establish the distance. Aha! See that? Now I can really get in there and I can get that sort of feel of spacecraft coming under there, that little drop shadow. So it's making the font pop off the top. Well, that's fantastic. That's what I want. Look, I can go in there. I can adjust the spread. There's all these different things. I can adjust the size of it. Okay, do you see that? It When I move size, be a little patient. Sometimes it does take the machine a little bit of time to give you that preview option. Okay, see, but what's really cool is now I'm developing like an official font, uh, a cool logo that I could use and still manipulate. Now, here's one thing that I like to do is that I never present things on just solid white paper. So let's come back here really quick. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on, put on a gray. Because usually when I present my work, uh, white kills things. And I like to have some form of either a light gray or whatever. So let me come in. Let's take this gray that's here. And I'm going to lighten it up just a teeny bit like so. So now let's go back here. When I right click on this, it takes me back to my, my font flat right here. And then I have the effects. So what's cool, you can see that it mentions FX layer on here. So now if I can come up here and I just double click on effects and then it even gives me the drop shadow option that's underneath it here in the layer selection. So what I can do is I can do all kinds of effects and these effects are really fantastic. They're a quick, easy way to make really cool looking um, logos and transitions. Um, and basically I'm not messing with the original typeface. I have that stuff seen. I've just compressed it. And let's, so let's go back into this and take a look at what we can do. So uh, I was messing with a drop shadow here, okay? So right now I need to go back here. Let's touch drop shadow. What if I didn't do it that way? Yes, you could click drop shadow back here. Hold on. If I click drop shadow back here, ooh, I put bevel and boss on there. It brings up the same option right to Dropbox. It's the same thing. So uh, nice at Dropbox, drop shadow that is. So now that I'm under here, I'm going to multiply, all right? Well, what happens? Look, I have all these other layer selections. Wow. Do you mean to tell me that my FX layer now has layer options? Absolutely it does. So who knows what could happen if I were to put it on pin light, hard light, all these other options, put it on normal, dissolve. It's going to totally affect the way that it's working. I even have opacity settings, okay? So let's just go for a base here. I want to create a drop shadow. Let's adjust the angle a little bit. So let's say you want your shadow going the opposite direction. Look at that. Boom, let's say you have a couple pieces and you have Frankenstein lighting with it coming from underneath. Well, you might decide to move your shadow accordingly. I prefer the sort of uh, drop shadow that goes to the left because I think that sort of complements the way that we read in Western society of weeding, reading, not weeding, reading left to right. And because of that, it makes me see everything with the shadow coming this way. But what's really cool, sometimes I do this on a particular image, right? So I can really create something really fast and easy. Well, let's take a look at some of the options in here. We have Bevel and Boss. What happens here if I come in here? Do you see what it just did there? Let me zoom up a little closer. It put a nice rounded edge on there. You see that? Here, let me take it off. See that? There's the hard type. Ooh, that's quite nice. You see how it makes it almost look 3D? Almost like I rendered spacecraft inside Maya and put it in there. Well, I didn't render it. And guess what? This is how I can make a logo really quick for uh, an animated series, a show, a pitch, something I'm working on, and get really great results. And part of it is because I'm using this little tab right down here. It's funny, as a as an artist being in the industry for numerous years and as a teacher, um, you know, I started teaching back in the day um, at because a couple of my mentors told me if you really want to learn your craft well, teach on the side. So when I was working in the industry, I used to teach on Saturday mornings and in, on Wednesday nights at a couple of different schools while I was working full time. And now I've sort of stuck with it. I never thought I would be in this position where now I'm full time at a, at a college heading up a program while I still freelance and work in the industry, right? Well, I use this all the time and so many of my students have no clue of what FX is and how to use it. But look at the results that I have down here. That looks pretty awesome. And I just started screwing with it. So look at the depth here. See that? Look at that. Now I'm getting that nice crafted edge. Look at the highlights on there. Photoshop's doing it for me, okay? Look, direction, do I want to go up or do I want the highlights down below? Well, that's awesome. Photoshop's going to do all this. Look, I can adjust the size of it. Ah. Oh. Horrible. Not a good idea. Come back here. Tone it down a little bit. Ooh, look at that. So I've now created a diverse typeface and wonderful font just in a couple of minutes by screwing around, okay? Now here's my favorite thing about this. I'm going to duplicate this, right? So how am I going to duplicate it? Look, that whole layer is right there. 
So if I duplicate this now, and this is where you gotta have fun with your layers, you gotta play with things, right? This is the wonderful part, check this out. I could come in here and I could modify this and Photoshop is gonna adjust it immediately through the filter. Let's say part of my story with spacecraft has debris or a ship or something that's falling apart, right? Check this out. I take my eraser right here. I decide to come in here. I'm gonna put my eraser at 30%. I start to erase part of this. See what it's doing? It's erasing it, but it's even affecting part of the shadow that's in there. How freaking cool is that, okay? So let's go to eraser. Let me command Z that. What is, uh oh, not that. One, two, three, four, five, six, there we go. So I could come in here, let's say I decide to have that look like there's falling debris coming from the sky and I decide to come back with a couple stripes going through part of my font. Yeah, that's badass. Look at that. Look, it did it for me. It beveled the cut for me. I'm just doing this with a mouse right now. I'm not even using a Wacom tablet. And look at how cool that looks. Boom. Awesome way to create a logo, right? Look, and I could do all kinds of funkiness. I could even flatten it. So what does that mean? It means every brush I have can have a visual effect now on top of my font and typeface. And I have hundreds of brushes. Lots of good texture brushes. Check this out. Boom. Look at that. Oh, awesome. Now I have, look at that. Now I'm getting metal that looks like it's got acid put on it. Okay. That's huge. And I can adjust my brush. What if I go really small in the corner on one brush? Let's come back here and take another brush. Take that texture brush. Oh, look at that. It looks like there's like this, look, it looks like the metal. Now I can come along the base of the metal here and I can make it look like the metal is eroding. Okay. Freaking awesome. So when I do these fonts like this and then I put that, look at that spacecraft right there. Okay. Look at that, that is pretty cool, right? Right, and I put that on and, and then I talk to a client and here's the great thing. You ready for this? They're like, they want me to do a logo or I do a logo for a show and I do this on the side when I'm doing a pitch and they go, hey, can you help us? Can you do a logo? I'm like, yeah, sure. We'll do freelance, right? Well, guess what? It's gonna take me like an hour or two to do a variety of logos for them because I know how I'm using this method of Photoshop here and things that I've learned from some graphic designers, right? And guess what? That logo took me a couple minutes. I don't bill in minutes. I'm sorry, but I bill by day. And so, yeah, that's, you know, yeah, I just did a logo for you. There's your finished design, 500 bucks. I spent 10 minutes to do it. So imagine if I'm working with a client um, and I give them a whole bunch of logos or a whole bunch of designs. This is the part of me outside of being a concept artist, an artist that's really fascinated with how design ties into graphic design, how that relates to Maya, all these other things, right? Excellent. So what does this mean? This means not only can I do it with type, I could come over here and I could create a spaceship, right? I could create a little spaceship symbol and then I could come down here, okay? I could put an FX on it and I could get it to even match. So I could have a whole little thing. What else can I do? Well, I could come over here and I could put a line going across, okay? Let's say I decided to do something like this. Um, let's say I decided to put some kind of a line down here, okay, oops. Um, sorry, my bad, I didn't create a new layer there. Right, I'm gonna put a little line right here. What I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna fill this line. Uh, I'm gonna go for some type of tone effect, right? So fill it with foreground color, there it is. Now that that's done, I'm gonna take this brush, I'm just gonna go down, basics, I'm gonna, just really quick, I'm gonna throw my brush across here. Let's go like eight. I'm trying to get like, you know, that feel of metal. And then now that I have a base medium on there, I'm gonna hit it with some white highlights really quick. So I'm just gonna come across here. Uh, yes, I'm using a mouse, just really simple here. Boom, too bright. Let's go back to like a 40. Okay, I'm gonna just sort of touch that corner. I'm gonna come in here, get this real small, try to get a little highlight or two back in here, get something maybe in there, sort of tap along here or whatever, something like this, okay? There it is, boom, done. Now that I have that strip in there, what am I gonna do? Well, that's another layer, right? So I'm gonna call that, I don't wanna lose it, remember? This was font two. So now I'm gonna say font, two and then I'm going to put bar there underneath. Well now that I have bar underneath there what I can do is I can just take this right here. Now what would be the smart thing to do folks? Duplicate it, save the original, be smart in case you mess it up it's there O-R-I-G boom. Now I turn that off now I come back to this I go to FX okay 
And this is what's cool. FX sometimes on some machines will remember the last uh, options you did. I go to drop shadow, pull that up, okay? Actually, this one didn't, it's, it got re reset itself. So I'm gonna go back, I need to check. I can go back to the original, so I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna leave that right now. I'm gonna go back to this drop box right here. I'm gonna click this open. I was at an angle right here at 115 at 95% at normal. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back up here. I'm gonna click on this 115. This should be at 95%, okay? And, uh, no, oh, what, I, what did I forget? I forgot the, let me click here. I had bevel and boss, shadow, distance of 19 points, okay? Come back here. So distance right here, put that at 19, and boom. I now have the same dimensions that I had for up above here. However, though, my bar's a lot thinner, so that's not really working for me right there. I just click Dropbox, I come back in, I'm gonna come back here, I'm gonna adjust the distance, get it a little bit closer to that bar, and I might angle it maybe a little bit more, but you'll see what it's doing is actually Photoshop's remembering, this is what's weird, I wish it would work on every layer, but the FX layer right now is adjusting the whole thing. Ah, I know, that's a pain in the ass part, but you know what? You get it working the way that you do, I can adjust, I know, it's like, well, why is that one affecting that one? Well, that's the way Photoshop works, and Photoshop's a pain in the butt sometimes. So if you don't want it to do that, you would have to flatten the layer, merge it together, and then it would become completely rasterized, and that would not happen. So for that drop shadow right now, I wanted it closer to 19, so I'm going to move that in a little bit about there. Okay, boom. That's cool, All right? It's in basically the same place. So now I created that. Well, look, let's say I decide to merge all that together. Let's say I want to match some of that up there. So let me zoom in. Let's go to erase, right? I'm gonna come in, erase a little bit right there. Make sure I'm at like 0%. 0% makes it cut through a little bit better. So I wanna get that sort of look. Let me go for another brush here. It might have a different effect. Zero, let's go right here. Let's see what happens if I cut that up a little bit. Maybe I cut that right there. Okay, so here I am in my logo creation. Let's say, let's use this guy here. Every brush has a different effect, which is so cool, right? because there's all these different presets in there. Oh, I like that right there. That's sort of fading off. Okay, cool. So there I have that. Well, I want to use that up above. Easy, just take it, duplicate it. Duplicate it, duplicate layer. Okay, sometimes I duplicate the layer and it just makes it richer and I'm like, oh, that's super awesome. There we go. Here's my spacecraft logo, okay? So everything that I just did right there with FX, okay, I could do with I mean, I just happened to pick this as an example. I could do this with wood, texture, any given texture that you can find, you could bring it in and multiply it. Well, what if fill? I don't want to do the texture. That's fine. You don't have to. Let's do that real quick here. I'm going to take this spacecraft that's right here. See that? Okay. So let me just right click on it, make sure I have the right layer right here. Um, oh, I had a double there. So let's go to the original. That's my original. Okay. Uh, and I didn't label it. So I'm going to just turn it off right now. Um, actually, let me duplicate the layer. Always duplicate. And to be honest, I'm doing a demo real quick. I need to go back. I would relabel some of my layers here so they're working correct. So let's just do this real fast. I have this version right now, right? Well, I'm going to duplicate it because I'm already envisioning what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a lighter version on top. So I'm going to come to this version right now. It's still an official type layer. I'm going to select the whole thing. I'm going to come down here. It was black, and now I'm going to put it a little bit more like a medium gray, about like here. Actually, let's go a little bit lighter like that. Boom, that's done. Okay, the reason why I do that is sometimes I like to do this off shift thing, right? So I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm gonna use these as highlights. I'm gonna turn on my original black here. All right, I'm gonna come down here. Let's put an FX layer on it, okay? Now, if I flatten all these, the FX choice I'm gonna do isn't gonna affect these. So let me just turn these off. Imagine I open up a new document file and I just flatten those. That way we can't see the effects that are happening. So now I have my spacecraft font here, right? Okay, um, what I'm gonna do here is click FX. Let's go for drop shadow in here. Uh, let me get the drop shadow going the right way that I want it, okay? Um, yeah, you could change the color of the drop shadow. I know, shut up, right? You can, all right? Let's try something different in here. What if I go to stroke? So what I was gonna do is I was gonna turn on this now that was up above it. Oops, hit okay. I'm gonna turn that on. So the reason why you turn that on, well, hold on a second, the lights went off in the classroom. Let me adjust this. Okay. Oops. 
It's pitch dark in my room now. Give me a second, guys. Okay, sorry about that. My lights went totally empty in here, and uh, I'm in a pitch dark room doing a demo, so I'm just going to have to do the best job that I can do here. Okay, so what I was getting to right there is that um, what I can do is see, now that I duplicated this type up above it, see what I can do is I can shift it. Oops, sorry. I can shift it over a little bit like this, and then I can modify it. I can erase it a little bit. So see how I have that? Then underneath I have the original drop shadow that's there, right? But this is what... This is pretty cool. Look, if I take my eraser now, oops, okay, and if I want to erase this, let me back up there, Command Z. I can't erase it right now because it's still tight, right? But if I right click on this and I rasterize it, and sometimes Photoshop, I don't know if you caught that, Photoshop picked it up when I hit erase. Um, and anyway, I think it rasterized it for me. It'll do that sometimes depending on your hotkeys and preferences you might have set in. But anyway, I have that in here. Now look, see, I can come in here and I can start picking at this. I can start erasing this, I can affect it with a brush. And I think that's pretty cool is because it can look like the exterior of a ship hull. So I'm erasing right now, well what if I do the same thing? What if I come back in with another brush? Let's take that same brush and I'm going to just raise my value here a little bit darker. Okay, and then I'm going to come in here, I'm going to come up here and look, I'm just going to tag a couple parts, boom. I'm going to hit like right there, ooh, overspray. Well that could be good, right? But it could not be cool. How do I, so what I want to do really quick, well, it's really simple. I know there's hotkeys for this. I learned it the old way, command all, and then I hit the move tool V, and then I hit the arrow button. So what I did is I just made that selection on top, and then I can hit control H to hide. So now as I come in here, I'm basically painting on top of that. I'm adjusting that almost as just a separate paint layer. And see what's really cool is I can quickly get these cool looks and sort of this other definition inside what's happening here, okay? So that's awesome. That's why I duplicated it. I always make a copy of that because now I can come down here to this effect, to the drop shadow, and I can, I can look at, see, I can move that drop shadow around. I can adjust its color, its setting. Let's try some other things. What if I put a, just curious here, what if I turn this off up above and to see what this looks like? What if I modify that more? Let's click drop shadow here. Um, let's put bevel emboss on that. Ooh, look at those little white highlights. I don't know if you caught those under bevel and emboss there. Let's try contour. Get that to pop up a little bit here. Let's go for size. There we go. Look at that. Pretty cool, right? So um, I can soften it, harden it up. Um, let's go for inner shadow. See what happens. You never know what you're going to get. You just got to get in here and you got to get used to sort of messing with this. Okay. So um, look at that. So look, I have something super cool here right now. That looks awesome. I mean, and I'm just doing this in a couple of minutes, right? Look, I still have this layer up above. Well, guess what? It is a separate layer. What if I come over here? What if I put this on just layer options? What if I go to normal? What if I put this on this overlay? What does it do? Oh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's sort of cool. It's sort of blended in a little bit of options in there. So what's multiply is always darker. So if I put it on multiply, it'll be dark. But what I can do then is light and multiply. See, and I could create that sort of effect like that where now it's riding on top and I have that sort of, you know, different feel. I can go back to V. I can move it over a couple so it's right on top of it. So you see how I did that? So I'm still, I'm just using multiple options very quickly here by using that FX layer. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up. I don't want this demo to be too long. But basically, if you've seen some of my other videos and demos, I talk about making a portfolio page. This is how you make an awesome looking logo to put on your portfolio page. Presentation is key. Presentation is, I mean, to be honest, it's 80, 90% of the first thing that somebody sees when you present your work. So what does that mean? Your presentation has to be at a high standard, your understanding of type, typography, and just the overall look and feel. If somebody looks at your page and you have really good artwork and you have shitty presentation, they're going to look at it and they're going to go, uh, yeah, the presentation is a little messed up. Someone else looks at it and they come in here and they see something that's really cool where, where you put emphasis into it. What does that mean? Well, it means I thought about the design. I, I used FX layers. Uh, I might have used um, uh, new adjustment layers, uh, clipping planes. I use all those things to come up with something that's really cool. And the outcome means I spent time on something to make it look great. And presentation is more than half of the battle. So anyway, enjoy. Thanks, guys. Take care.